Okay, now what I'd like to do is talk about what does this mean for veterinary educators, particularly those in pharmacology, um, as we move forward? What have we learned from the pandemic? What things should we um, hopefully apply going forward? Firstly, I think we need to embrace hybrid teaching models. Um, these are becoming more popular post-pandemic because people realized there were some things that they could accomplish that way. Um, there's some efficiencies, there are, there are affordances of being in person and there are affordances of being online. So well-designed hybrid models have actually been shown, and this is not in necessarily in medical education, but in other scenarios to improve student outcomes. Uh, we want to be able to foster educational equity and inclusion. And this is not what, you know, the current initiatives on equity and inclusion. Um, with regards to those type of people that would enter our profession, rather uh, how they learn. And so there are inequities right now. We have these people who are raising their hand in the front. They get, they're in the front of the, to get, to get their attention. They get some uh, re per personal reward for raising their hand and engaging. And we know there's four or five students that'll be like that in any given class. But those in the back, this particularly this guy, aren't necessarily engaged, in fact, actually find it a little bit off-putting about this kind of interaction. And so why not emphasize the smaller potential for making things seem smaller or being anonymous peer review or requiring everybody to participate or contribute without fear of what it is they might have said to begin with. It's not, nobody's gonna judge them by this. And in online platforms, can facilitate this. In the last decade or so, we've been really big on building out clinical skills labs. Those clinical skill labs need to, in more and more, engage mental skills. Now, as pharmacologists, as well, we know we don't have too many gimmicks. You know, we don't have sutures they have to learn or anything. They maybe need to know how, however, to find a treatment, justify it, understand the drug mechanism, uh, calculate a dosage, all of those things. So we need to have these clinical skills include being able to apply their basic research ideas. And blended and self-paced online learning, or even pushing them back when they haven't, they don't get the concept, pushing them back to a video or pushing them back to some learning online is one way to do it. Not always having to give them the answer and sort of move on and then they don't really learn from that. Now, one thing that um, we've done at the University of Illinois is use a platform that my educational colleagues have created called CG Scholar that puts them in a multimedia writing mode. And we've used it to have the students write case uh, analyses. Uh, in this case, I've shown here on the right, sorry, Tricia, um, an example that um, one of my colleagues here has done, a pharmacologist, has written some short piece and, and and then we had some peer review uh, process that can go on. It can be rubric guided, it can be anonymous, um, and we'll talk about later, it can also be art done by artificial intelligence. Um, but the main thing is that you're then keeping track of what a student does with regards to not just their first effort, but their revision, but their ability to help as a peer. Um, all of these aspects of being a professional can be tracked within this online community. In addition, we built into the um, this, and this is actually a map that was created from Trisha's uh, writing of concepts that come from medical ontologies, over 900 of them that you can choose from, and they can be connected by various connectors and descriptors to allow you to map out thinking against existing uh, definable medical terminology and knowledge. Uh, in addition, Google Translate's involved, so it can be done in multiple languages this way. So getting to map a student's thinking uh, becomes possible and important. And finally, just recently, of course, um, this CG map tool has been created that uh, uses the same rubric that the peers might have used to evaluate uh, a writing and the ChatGTP um, can do an artificial intelligence review of the student's draft and provides automated 
comprehensive. Some, in most cases, it's writing two to three times is more than what the peers are writing. Uh, peer review. So this this can allow the faculty to be not so concerned about the uh, ability of reading everything because you've got peer review, you've got artificial intelligence helping you uh, do this. And the students will feed back and you'll see in the final products, even if you just take a select, select few of them, that this has been very helpful. So to summarize, uh, what I want to leave you with is that new learning, I would call it new learning post-pandemic or pre-pandemic is reflexive. It's not fixed, not fixed by time and place. Um, the students can behave, be ubiquitous uh, using online tools. They can become a monology maker, which puts them in a more active learning mode. They can use multimedia, which is um, more modern. It's what they're going to be dealing with there and there. And they're pretty good at this, by the way. Uh, and then you can put them into recursive informative modes using analytics to judge their performance as a professional or, or developing professional. They can engage collaborative intelligence like they'll need to do in practice, reflect on it. And all of this can be, in theory, very flexible, differentiated uh, as they become knowledge makers and not consumers. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions. And this picture is actually a picture uh, that was made into a look like an oil painting from an actual photograph of students uh, that I took at one point engaging in case-based learning.